once again, we are here on the On The Whistle podcast and we are fortunate uh, to have a guest of the magnitude of the great central midfielder that back in the day when midfielders didn't have one role like you have today, the sitting midfielder, Eric Tinkler was the midfielder that did both jobs, getting forward and getting back and scoring goals, played for the national team, played in Portugal, played in Italy at Gianfranco Zola's own team, <coughs> and then back to Wits University, all the way from Rodeport, Mr. Eric Tinkler. How are you today? Well, in you, sir. All good. Thank you. I must say to you, firstly, Eric, you're only the second person I know from Rodeport. <laughs> <laughs> it's you and Bradley Mir. Those are the only two guys I know. What <laughs> <laughs> oh, was? I'd never known they played football that far. No, yeah, the West Rand. We were. I started at a small club called Devon Deep, which is the, obviously the Devon Deep mine out on the West Rand, and I started there at the very young age of five years old, and I played there for for two years uh, under my father, who was the the coach of the team back then. And then I obviously moved to to a club called Florida Albion, which was also on the West Bank. But yeah, born and bred in Riddyport, you know, went to school there and grew up there, you know. But uh, still have fond memories of, of those days. Well, we all start somewhere, Eric. And mm. where we'd like to start today is you are now an international playing for Bafana at the 96 AFCON, which is held in South Africa. Can you, because that was a legendary team, you went on to not just win the tournament, dominate the tournament. Yeah. How did being in that change room change you as a player and eventually educate you in the future as a manager? Yeah, I think, um, obviously, you know, 96, I was already playing in Portugal at the time. And uh, I actually got identified quite late by um, Bafana Bafana uh, to come and represent uh, South Africa. You know, I wasn't part of the squad when it was formed back in 1992. I got my first opportunity to to play for Bafana Bafana on a tour to Australia, uh, where we played two games against Australia. And really, I think that was when the team that that obviously won the AFCON in 96 was really started to see its formation. Um, some of the, the older players, Steve Compella, as an example, I think it was the last time that he actually represented the final was when we went on that, that tour and you had all the players, Wiki Robotham, uh, Peter Gordon, these were all the guys that uh, were representing Bafana Bafana. Then I was a young boy when I played for Vitz. You know, I started at Vitz at the age of 17 for the, the old NSL team. And and those guys were, were my peers, you know. And uh, it took a while for me to be be, be called up to that, that national team. And, and prior to, obviously, us winning the results and that type of thing went, weren't brilliant and uh, I think you know Clyde Barker he started obviously then looking to scout a little bit better in terms of which other players he could bring in and obviously he found out about me playing in Portugal and then I was called in obviously very very happy to be part of that squad in in 96 we had a quality team quality players. There were, I think there were only six of us that were actually playing abroad. A lot of the other players were still playing in the local league. Um, but those five, six players that were playing abroad obviously made, made a huge difference to, to the national team and obviously to the success that we had in 1996. I don't think any of us really understood the importance or, you know, I won the AFCON in 96. I went back to Portugal. I think the, the final was played on a Saturday and the Sunday. I flew back to Portugal because I had obviously league fixtures because, 
you know, it's actually held in a very, very important time uh, in the European V, because that, you know, they have contacts placed January, February, and normally that's crunch time in Europe. So I didn't have any time to celebrate the victory in 96. And uh, I flew back following day, and, you know, for me, life continued. Now you, you look back, what is it, 25 years, and you say to yourself, wow, what an achievement because Buffon has never managed to do that ever again. You know, but, and I think to a degree that kind of helped us because we had a, a lot of self-belief in ourselves uh, collectively as a team. Uh, we, we didn't really study the opposition as much as we do nowadays. You know, I do a lot of opposition analysis every single day, studying their strengths and their weaknesses, but we didn't do that. We just focused on ourselves. And uh, I think we were probably a little bit naive when it comes to certain countries, Ghana, uh, Cameroon, you know. Not that I say we underestimated them, but we didn't respect them as much as you would respect them today. You know, the minute you hear about Cameroon and Ghana, you know, the players think, oh, this is going to be a tough match. You know, we went into those games not thinking like that. We went in those games thinking, no, we we better than them. We 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 know what our strengths are. We know what our weaknesses are. We have to work for one another. And uh, you know, obviously, getting all the way to the final, then winning it against Tunisia was an unbelievable achievement. But like I said to you in the beginning, you know, I didn't find it such a big big deal. To to be brutally honest, you know, I didn't think the Afcon was such a major tournament internationally. But I did see, obviously, after after the AFCON, the actual importance of the AFCON because it changed my life because I ended up going to play in the Serie A, even though I was playing in Europe at the time. And it changed the lives of a lot of the other guys because, yeah, in South Africa, as you well aware, back those days, there wasn't a professional league. So you played more for the passion of the game than the financial reward. So a lot of players obviously got, got great moves. Mark Fish moved to Lazio. Uh, Sean Bartlett moved to America. Andre Ironson moved to Fulham. You know, so, and I and I, I can mention so, so many that, that got opportunities to go into Europe, which had uh, they all just played for their club, Kaiser Chiefs, Orlando Pirates. That I don't think that would have really, really happened. Now, just following on from the last point in my question, I said to you there, Eric, you know, you're looking at those experiences uh, and those opportunities you've just spoken about. The learning curve, you're a manager now. What do you take from the 96 experience as a player that you've implemented now as a manager? You know, I think first and foremost, I think I need to mention that. You know, I've always been passionate as a as a footballer to, to want to become a manager. My first experience of actually coaching a team, believe it or not, was actually a tender age of 18 because, um, I went to complete my matric at uh, Damlin college and there was a referee back then that was referee in the NSL, uh, a gentleman called uh, George Lobo, who was actually a science teacher at Damlin. And then he heard that I was joining uh, Damlin College and he was running, obviously, the football department of the, the college itself. And he asked me to come in and play for the team, but then at the same time, coach the team. So I fell in love with coaching already then. But me personally, as a player, as a youngster, I wasn't the most talented. I wasn't the most gifted. Uh, I wasn't the quickest. So if anything I needed to learn and I needed to learn fast was to to become astute of the game or understand the game, learn the game. And I think that that ended up being being my strength as a as a player because I could I could read situations and and I've taken that in, in terms of my, my coaching same way, you know. The experiences in 1996, I think, like I said before to you, you know, we 
It's not that we disrespected the likes of Ghana and Cameroon when we beat them, but uh, we didn't overanalyze it. And I think I do that uh, now in my coaching career. I don't overanalyze it. I first try and look at where our strengths lie, and I, I tend to focus mainly on that. But I obviously, you know, make the players aware that, you know, the opposition that you play do have a system that you might find complicated, especially defensively. How do we press them? Where do we press them? When do we press them? Uh, how do we break them down? You know, do you try and help the players to a certain degree, but at the same time, you want them to have a little bit of freedom uh, to be able to go out there and express themselves, you know, so... I think if anything, that's that's the one thing I can take from from Clive Barker. It's, it's nothing uh, against Clive, but he wasn't the, the most brilliant tactician. But he was one hell of a motivator. You know, he motivated us, and he had a lot of belief in us. And and you know, we took on that responsibility of 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 uh, putting out uh, good performances in order to get the the right result. Speaking to the point of you being a player um, and having had your experiences you've had, like you've said, being in Europe before the AFCON even kicks off, you were our own Pierre Issa before we even found out about Pierre Issa. Um, when did you enjoy your football the most, having traveled through Portugal, Italy, England, Yorkshire, where it's so cold? Where did you enjoy your football the most as a player? I think, honestly, um, my time in Portugal, you know, I still, my wife is from Portugal. I still have a house there. I have a lot of friends there. I spent six years there before I got that move to, to Italy. Two of those years I spent in basically the Portuguese third division, a very low and deep. And then... Uh, managed to get the opportunity to move to Vittorio Stugo, who were then, they 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 got relegated from the, the Portuguese La Liga into the second division. And that's when I joined them and we ended up uh, uh, getting promoted. We finished second in the league, promoted into the Portuguese Premier League, and then I obviously spent four seasons with them. And... Uh, I made a lot of friends there. I found Portuguese people very, very open to to foreigners. Um, the players themselves uh, had a lot of respect towards me. I had a lot of respect towards them. Welcomed me in the right the right manner. Um, Italy, I loved Italy. To be honest, you know, playing the Serie A that was a dream. Because we're talking about 1996, the Serie A, in my opinion, still in the biggest league. Top league then was the top yeah. league. Yeah, exactly. It was every single team, whether it was from Juventus, AC Milan, Inter Milan, to Atalanta, to Udinese, every single team had an uh, international player. You know, so so it was a really, really strong, strong league. Um, but possibly because. I went to Sardinia, the island of Sardinia. I found it very, very difficult to adapt there because I enjoy my privacy. I enjoy my my time off. And on the island that was that was very, very difficult, you know. So my 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 spell there, I didn't really really have a great, a great time. Had I have stayed on the continent and I've been at another club, then I think possibly I would have stayed in in Italy, and I wouldn't have moved across to, to England, you know. Uh, and then obviously I spent the five years playing in playing in England, and like you said, yes, cold, miserable, and... <laughs> like, it like, is, but, like it is yeah. today, like it is yeah. today. <laughs> <laughs> and like Portugal, the weather in Portugal reminds me a lot of what we experienced here in Cape Town, especially where I was living. And then Cagliari, you know, you're closer to Africa than what you are to Europe. So the weather there was also phenomenal, you know. But but England, I loved the experience when I was a young boy. That that was my dream. 
to go play in England. And I had my first taste of that back in 1987 when I went on trial as a young boy to Coventry City. And unfortunately, this is still there in the apartheid there. And I spent six months there and I couldn't get work permits. And, and I was sent back home and I thought that dream had come to an end. But, you know, I had almost done a full circle literally 10 years later. I ended up signing for, for Barnes here and found myself south in England, yeah. So you, you have a well-traveled career at some of the biggest countries, and I, I still say Italy at the time you moved there was yeah. one of the best leagues in the world. Absolutely yeah. one of the best leagues in the world with the top stars in the world. Yes. In your career, you win the African Nations, you come back, you start your managerial career, your history in managerial, you start with, you You continue at Pirates, a big club in South Africa, you end up at Cape Town City now, yeah. under a very good leadership of this Mr. John Cometis, who we've had on our yeah. show before. What are you finding about, finding out about being in Cape Town, at Cape Town City, that he's working for you personally. Yeah, I think, I think I have to go back. You know, this this is my second uh, time that I'm here. Yeah. Um, like you said before, I actually I started my coaching qualifications while I was still a player. As I said, I was passionate about becoming a coach later in life. So I actually started my coaching badges while I was still playing in England, and. Uh, at the age of 35, I was already thinking, do I call it quits in terms of my playing career and start focusing more on the on the coaching side? And I ended up returning to Bits, who unfortunately got relegated from the PSL. And I was very good friends with the CEO of Bits at the time, Derek Blankensee, who was actually my under-16 coach when I played for Bits. And he, he asked me to please come in and, and play for the team to try and get it promoted again. And then also act as the assistant coach, you know. So I thought it was probably the right starting point for me just to to get a bit of a, an experience, especially on the coaching side and the managing side and the financial side of things in terms of how the club is run. And... Uh, that was an extremely valuable experience, and I ended up getting an opportunity to work with uh, Roger Desar, a colleague of mine, who obviously we played together in the squad of 96 uh, in the AFCON. And uh, Roger got the opportunity to go to Orlando Pirates, and he saw my work ethic and my knowledge. I was doing a lot of analysis on my own. You know, I didn't have an analyst. At the time, I became the analyst and the assistant coach. And and I ended up going to Pirates, where I spent five fantastic years, you know. And But then the Cape Town City opportunity arose. And what I loved about the Cape Town City job was I had an opportunity to, to build something from scratch, which is similar to what I'd done at Bits because... Like I said to you, when I joined there, I was asked, you know, what, what did the club need to do to to try and make it more professional? And I said, well, the first thing we need to do is ensure that our development structures are in place so we can start bringing the young players coming through the, uh, through, through the youth system. You know, a lot of players that played for the old NSL team came through the Witzinger juniors, and that wasn't the case anymore. And, so I set up that whole structure, and then the club became pretty successful within the space of two years. We managed to get 23 young players into the various age groups of the national team. And and I really, really felt that, you know, the job that we had done there, I enjoyed extremely, you know, seeing those youngsters grow year by year and getting better. Yeah, it was an opportunity now, Cape Town City, a uh, club that obviously existed back in the 60s and the 70s uh, that was very, very popular in Cape Town at the time that that basically disappeared off the face of the earth 
uh, and and reignited by by John meetings. And you know, I had a meeting with him, and he told me exactly um, what had transpired. He bought Black Aces, and he was now looking to to start a new club in Cape Town called Cape Town City. Uh, the bad news being, we've only got five of those players that played for Black Aces. Those are the only ones that actually agreed to to making the move to Cape Town. And when I started the the preseason, we had eleven players in total. So a difficult task in a space of six weeks. We needed to put a team together uh, to compete first and foremost in the the MTN eight, uh, and then obviously in the league. And and I enjoyed that challenge, loved that challenge, and you know we we ended up putting together a very very good squad of players that that a lot of them weren't really featuring in the clubs that they they represented before, uh, so they came with a lot of hunger and desire, and we ended up winning the Telcom Cup. We ended up finishing third in the league and having an absolutely fantastic season. So I think the main reason was that, that 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 being able to to build from scratch and, and look to create something from from the ground up. I think that's what inspired me to to want to come to Cape Town City. And probably when I left a year later to to Supersport, you know, I kind of regret the the decision that I made. So I'm extremely passionate about the football club and obviously very, very happy to, to now be back at the club. And last season, we had a pretty successful season, finishing second. This season, we've had a bit of a rough ride. We, we currently find ourselves in 10th. But uh, I truly believe, you know, another two, three good results and we can find ourselves back in the, the top four again. Now, talking about how you cultivated this team to be where they currently are at the moment with Mr. John Kamitas, having interviewed him before he spoke about his ambitions and aims of putting together a new stadium, I think in the center of Athlone, um, how will that project help you as the manager uh, continue to spearhead the brand of Cape Town City? Yeah, I think just just to correct you, the the, the area that we put that stadium is the old uh, Hartley Vale. Oh, my apologies, Hartley yes. Vale. Yes. Oh, yes. sorry to the people of Cape. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's in the observatory, and uh, you know we we know with politics they don't happen overnight. They they take time. I was yeah back in 2016 when John showed me the plans for the stadium. And I think that would be an absolutely brilliant achievement if we can actually get that stadium built. You know, I'm not saying anything against Cape Town Stadium or the DHL Stadium as it is known now. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a massive stadium. It holds 65,000. Uh, us as a club, we, we can't draw as many fans as that as much as we would love to. But I think that stadium would bring is 10,000 loyal fans week in, week out. And I think it will create that, that club atmosphere that I think uh, you don't see much of anymore in South Africa. Uh, we obviously got new structures that, that we've started to form and we've been pretty successful successful with. And, you know, those training fields are, are just basically across the road from the stadium. So I think those younger players will get that opportunity similar to what you see at Manchester City, you know, where they train, they cross a bridge and they can see the main stadium. So they can see exactly what the target is, what the objective is for themselves. And obviously that's that's being able to give back to the, the, the community. So, so you talk about the pressures that you have, the fans, the money, the targets, all your supporters out there in Cape Town at the moment, which is, I must say, one of the most beautiful places to live in South Africa. Yes. What are your targets for Cape Town City this football calendar year? Obviously, we set the target, obviously, looking to finish in the top four. Um, 
that was always the the ambition to to ensure that we finish in the top four. Um, currently, as we see ourselves, you know, one win we could find ourselves sixth in the league. This this season, the league is extremely tight. Uh, one or two losses in a row, and you find yourself in a relegation battle. Two wins in a row, you find yourself in the top five. So it's going to be extremely tough, but our objective doesn't change. You know, my objective never changes. I'm I'm always been a very ambitious manager. I never plan or prep a game where I'm going in to get a draw. I always look to win, irrespective of who we who we play against. And and those targets remain for me. We have eleven. We have eleven games left. Nothing says that we can't go on a run of three, four wins in a row. And then that target becomes more than achievable. You know, so I've always believed in setting your targets high, aiming high, because that 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 has to motivate you, you know, as as a player, you know. When you set your targets low, you start resting on your laurels, you don't really uh put in the right effort, the right amount of work. So we we aim high and we 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 put a lot of responsibility on on everyone, not only the players but but on everyone. And like I said to you before, me as a manager, I'm a, I'm a hard work. You know, I spend my life with football, so my expectation is the same from the players that that play for me. That they they go out there and first play with uh, responsibility and taking that responsibility but at the same time knowing that you know this is their profession and you know you only get one opportunity at this where I've seen footballers come and go where I've seen footballers arrive and within a space of six months go from a plastic bag with their boots in their hands to earning millions of rands at a bigger club within a space of six months. That's how quick... Sorry, Eric, you're not being rude. You're, you're, oh, there you go. Please continue. Yeah. So I was saying how quick your life can change, you know, in in football. Uh, both up and down. You know, and the players, you know, it's important to understand that your footballing career is a short career. Uh, the career or the time span that you have where you can make a lot of money is very limited. So you've got to try and make the best use out of it that, that, that you can, you know, and never rest on your laurels, always aim higher than what you achieve the following season. And, and that's the expectation I've obviously put on, put on, put on the, the squad itself. Now you spoke about being an ambitious manager. You spoke about Mrs. Tinkler being from Portugal. Do you have any ambitions of managing abroad, especially like a country, Portugal? And then, do you have ambitions for the Pafana Pafana job in the future? I think, obviously, like I said, I would love to be able to go coach somewhere in Europe. That would be, obviously, the ultimate uh, target. But, I know that purely coaching in the PSL, that that objective could be difficult. That's why I try and take it serious for us to qualify for CAF competitions, uh, Confederations, Champions League, because I think if you can get into those competitions and be successful, uh, then it makes for a better CV <laughs> at the end of the day. You know, obviously, I had the experience at um, Orlando Pirates reaching the CAF Confederation Cup final. I had the experience at Supersport United also reaching the CAF Confederations Cup final, and I know exactly how much that can do for your for your CV. You know, so I think I'm no different to any other other coach. I think everybody would love to be able to get into Europe, but I know exactly how difficult that is. So I'm not saying Europe, but you know, I'd love to one day have the opportunity, North Africa somewhere, go go and coach a club there. 
learn something from from that. Maybe you know somewhere else on the African continent. Hopefully, get somewhere in Asia someday. Um, but yeah, that's why I think I I just keep working hard because that that has always been been the ambition to to one day coach at the highest uh, the highest level. Then Bafana Bafana, yes. One day, you know, one day maybe, but I, I think I still I'm I'm still very, very happy coaching in the league format uh, at club level. Um but obviously an opportunity one day to, to coach your national team would be obviously a, a blessing. Well, we hope you get the opportunity, um, Eric, because your experience that you have as a player and as a manager being added to the Bafana Bafana job would only make them better and continue to raise this flag that hasn't been at its best over the last few years. But coming back to Bafana Bafana and the group of, the let me use the word elite group of players you played with. Yes. What was the secret to the success of that team you played in that really made a ripple in Africa? Passion. Simple. Passion. We played for the love of the game, first and foremost. I think the game has evolved now. It's changed to a degree. You know, that, that squad of 96, as I said before, even even the players that were playing abroad weren't making the type of money footballers are making today. So the first reason why you played football was because you loved the game and you played with the passion and the desire to to want to win. And I think that that, that was a key element for us, was that we first and foremost loved the game.